Welcome back to WMBF News this week. We are sitting down with Governor Mark Sanford in his last scheduled sit down interview with the media as he takes a look back at the past eight years and beyond that here in South Carolina. Um, let's take a little bit of a look forward mm -hmm. and uh, I know it's no one's got the crystal ball, of course, but as you look forward um, and so many people were talking about you as potentially a presidential candidate for 2012. Um, some people even talking about a vice presidential candidate for 2012. Some people talking about uh, other seats. What interests you right now when you look forward? Um, unpacking a bunch of boxes that have moved from <laughs> Columbia down to the farm. <laughs> right. uh, you know, I'm, Short term. I'm, I'm, you're up here, and I'm I'm kind of at the, the the level of mundane and practical. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, on Wednesday I wrap up my duties. Yeah and I'll head down to the coast. Um, uh, Charleston slash the farm is going to be my stomping ground and I've used the farm something of a staging area in terms of moving stuff and uh, I, I, you know, I think what interests me next is uh, n not so much worried about who's going to be president of the United States next or the, you know, the oncoming campaigns but the more practical of I got to get those boxes unloaded. <laughs> the, the interim. Yeah. Um, can you can you say this? I know U.S. Senator Lindsey Graham has said so far out of the potential 2012 candidates, he likes Mitt Romney. Um, of any of the names that you've heard thrown about, are there any that uh, seem intriguing to you at this point? And I know it's early. Yeah, but, uh, I've not really. Uh, you know, we've been really, really busy throughout the fall. We've been busy wrapping up shop. We've been really busy in this last week saying goodbye to a bunch of folks that mm -hmm. have been blessed to meet here over the last, you know, uh, eight, ten, or seventeen years, as the case might be, in the yeah. world of politics. Um, and so I've not given it a lot of focus. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, there's already a stable of candidates going. I suspect there'll be many more before it's all said and done. It sounds like there's going to be a bunch of people running. Each time you pick up the paper or hear a news report, it seems like there's somebody else that's thinking about running. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm going to wait and see who all's in. And then, you know, I know many of these guys. Many of these guys either served in, in the governorship with or I got to know them during my experiences in Congress. And uh, we'll wait and assess as, as we get a little bit closer to uh, when all that heats up, which isn't far away. Yeah, so you're not going to give us a name that you like. <laughs> not at this point. <laughs> not right now. Um, looking forward, does it, can you at least say whether uh, politics on some level seem appealing to you? Uh, having it been in your blood this long, I w would think it'd have to be, but maybe not. Would you think maybe the business world uh, seems more appealing? Well, I came from business, and I intend to go back to business. Um, there have been a variety of different side detours that have taken me out of business and into the world of politics. But, you know, when I got elected to Congress, I said if I got elected, I wouldn't stay more than three terms, which is six years, and I'd come home. And I did just that. I, I called it quits after three terms. Uh, and then, you know, I got, you know, a group came and said, can we have lunch? Yeah, we can have lunch. And they approached me about running for governor. One thing led to another, and here we are. Um, I think that life has a lot of different turns and twists to it. You take it a day at a, at a time. I would say it is my intent to go back into the world of business, but you never say never. Now, when I say you never say never, you at that point say, well, you're thinking about running for office. No, I'm not thinking about running yeah. for office. I think I'm going to back into business, but I don't have a plan, and I'm going to figure it out over the next couple of months. Yeah. Uh, I do want to jump back to something as far as, uh, you know, your efforts in the past eight years. The campaign was all about reforming state government, of course. Uh, you touched on a couple of items. Is there anything that you feel could have been done further under your leadership? And, and of course, the thought was, unless the Budget and Control Board is abolished, there's not a lot that can be done. Mm -hmm. but, but looking back, I did want to ask, could more have been done, or do you feel like your hands were tied? Well, I mean, at some level, more can always be done. And then the nature of, of your work, my work, uh, you get to the end of the day, you go, oh, I wish I, I could have done a little bit more of this or a little bit less of that. That's the nature of any of our works. Uh, and you can Monday afternoon quarterback yourself to death, say, well, I you know, could have done whatever. But, but think about the different fights. I mean, that whole bobtailing uh, phenomenon wherein all kinds of unrelated bills would be added to a bill, we challenge that, cause sparks to fly. But at the end of the day, that went to the South Carolina Supreme Court. The South Carolina Supreme Court ultimately ruled in our favor, and that changed. Mm -hmm. Think about, you know, uh, before we came to office, no governor had ever produced an operational executive branch budget. We said, wait a minute, you know, the front row seat in what happens in any political year 
is how much you spend in this year and what you spend it on. Right. And everything else is bleachers. And so we said, you know, we don't have a better perspective, but we do have a statewide perspective. And that ought to be a part of our budget setting process as, all, as well, because if it's legislative dominated, it's just simply what's good for your district and your district and your district and your district, you end up with a lot of duplication, which has everything in the world to do with, with the fact that we're 138% the U.S. average in the cost of our state government versus other state governments. So did that cause sparks to fly? Yeah, but it was important. And, and, and similarly, you know, the Budget Control Board, we're the only state in the United States of America that has a budget control board that handles the administrative functions that are handled by the other 49 governors mm -hmm. of the United States. Now, I'd hate to know the number of Rotary Club talks and whatnot that I've spoken on that, but here's the good news. We didn't make that change. We, we weren't able to pull it across the finish line. But, but in life, you've got to plow the field before you plant it. You've got to plant it before you harvest it. You've got to harvest it before you sell it. And I think that that, that, that one is going to be harvested this coming year. Uh, I think that the Budget Control Board will change this coming year. You know, Dan Cooper, who's head of Ways and Means, said in the Greenville paper about two months ago, he thought it would change, which is really telling given the fact that he, uh, among others, has historically resisted change right. there. So, you know, I think that some of the structural changes occurred during our time in office. Others, I think, will ripple forward based on a whole lot of conversation we've had over eight years on the need for certain changes. Sure. Uh, We've had a lot of Facebook comments of people that said, boy, if I could ask the governor anything, there'd be a lot of questions to mm -hmm. ask. And of course, many of the national talk shows have already done so. Can you touch at least on the ethics uh, fees? And uh, there's no admission of guilt, uh, mm -hmm. and you'd spoken pretty vehemently mm -hmm. about it. Um, I believe it's seventy-two or $74,000 hours that were paid for some violations, some fees. What's your thought on that? For people who say, I'm glad the governor paid up, mm -hmm. um, but do you feel like uh, those violations were merited? You know, you, you can't win in those things, and that's why we ended up just saying, you know, I, I, I can't win, let's just pay, a, but, 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 but keep in mind, I, I was in technical violation. I used business class tickets, uh, going on, you know, business trips to, to Europe, to, to, you know, China, go down the list. Um, but every governor for the last 30 years has traveled business class on, on making these, you know, investment trips. They, they, and there's probably a reason for doing so. You fly all night to Europe, you, you land that morning, there's a car waiting for you, and you're going to your first appointment at 9.30 that morning to a breakfast mm -hmm. meeting, and you're busy throughout the day. And the idea of getting a little bit of sleep before you go and try and sell South Carolina to some for, you know, foreign corporation is probably a, a, a good idea. Um, the investment versus the potential yeah, loss. Yeah, and, and, so, and so I didn't think <coughs> twice about it. It's the way, again, every governor, uh, every secretary of commerce, um, you know, a long list of House and Senate members have traveled business class on those kinds of trips. In my case, they said, well, you know, that was a break to the law. Our point was, well, then why didn't you prosecute for these other 30 years? But mm -hmm. it was what it was. It was a mess. And we just figured, let's just move on. We're not going to win this, and let's call it quits. Yeah. But, you know, anytime you're explaining the world of politics, generally you're losing. And, you know, it was one of those we didn't think we could win on, so we moved on. For someone who says, though, Mark Sanford is such a fiscal conservative, slept in your own office uh, mm -hmm. in Congress, pensions pennies, whether they're his own or the state's, um, boy, this doesn't seem like Mark seems like, even though he probably needed to sleep to sell the state, he would just be nickeling, diming everybody, including himself. I, no, I, believe me, you can talk to the agents how we could turn off the car when I'm not, you know, we're in it. And it'd be August, and they're like, oh, you out of your mind? We're normally <laughs> used to keeping the car running. I, I, I've done, I know penny pension, and I've done it all of my life. My dad beat it into me. My dad was a Depression-era guy, and he yeah. said empty rooms love darkness, and there was a fly swatter on a risk if, you know, we didn't turn off the light. I mean, I know penny pension, but at times you can be penny-wise and pound-foolish. Mm -hmm. And I would say this to any future governor, the idea of getting on a plane, not getting any sleep, looking like you've been drinking all night and stepping into a corporate boardroom the next morning at 930 is just not a good idea. And think about the, the in other words, you're talking about a little bit more, I, I don't want to defend business class tickets on international trips, but what I would say is, Vaudalina, for instance, on, we took trips to Rome, for instance, trying to get Vaudalina, and ultimately they invested $600 million in South Carolina, 
And what Enzo Caiazzo, who was one of the decision makers, would tell you was the reason that Boeing is there is because Vaudalina was there. If there wasn't that original $600 million beachhead of investment, Boeing wouldn't have come in. They were a supplier to yeah. Boeing before Boeing decided for the first time to produce you know, uh, airline production outside of Everett, Washington. First place ever. There are only three places in the world where wide body jets are made in France, yeah. Everett, Washington, and now Charleston, South Carolina. But when you're talking about a $600 million investment, I, I think it's best to be on your game. And I'm not defending business class tickets. We used it. They've been used for 30 years. Uh -huh. And uh, it was what it was. Should Nikki Haley uh, take advantage of this? I'm not. I'm, again, it's <laughs> it's against the law right now. They're talking about changing the law. Yeah. Uh, but I, you know, anyway, I think we beat that dead horse long enough. Fair anyway. enough. Fair enough. Talking with Governor Mark Sanford in his last scheduled sit-down interview here on WV News this week, we're going to talk more about his accomplishments, maybe some of his regrets as we return. Stay close.